Uh, we are excited um, about the many, many opportunities that God is providing for us as a church. Um, the ways that we get to be involved in things that are happening, not only locally, but also globally, and, and opportunities that we have to share in that. We're so appreciative um, that we are a part of a body that, that has chosen to, um, to take these things on and to address them. It means a lot to us, and, and we appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, we recognize that. I, uh, I um, several years ago, had the opportunity, as I did as a youth pastor, and pretty much every summer, I led a team of students down to Ecuador. You've heard me talk about this before, and um, just always been a really positive experience. But in this particular year, our, our, one of our major tasks, our jobs, was along the side of the mountain that this camp is sort of situated on um, is a road that leads to kind of the peak of the mountain. And they were having trouble because every time during the raining season, the water would run down the side of the mountain. It would re erode so much of the road that it made it very difficult and, and sometimes dangerous to travel on. And so we were going to dig a trench to help, um, help route the water out in a way that would not erode uh, away the road. And so we set up there as a team. This was going to be, we're there about probably 12 days, and this was going to be one of our major projects. We were out there every day. And this is probably, I would guess, somewhere around three quarters of a mile that we're digging this trench along the side of around. So it's, it's, it's a substantial project, and there's no uh, massive equipment or anything like that. This is all shovels and pickaxes and, and that sort of thing. And we're up there digging, and then part of this project, one of the camp directors was up working kind of alongside us, and we were uh, working in this tough, dry ground, digging this trench. The kids were just troopers, amazing. We would start each day by talking about how far do we think we can get? Where do we need to be by lunch? We had this goal that we're gonna set, and it began to be achievable in our heads. We began to think, okay, we, we can do this. Um, but as they were working on this, they started to kind of regrade the road. And so there was this guy up there on his tractor, and he's helping kind of fill in all the gaps and voids that have been caused by the water. But inadvertently, or I'm assuming it was inadvertently, he started to fill in our trench, um, which was like, what are you doing? You know, like, and, and we kind of were like trying not to get discouraged, but it kept happening like day after day. Like we would, and it was loose dirt. It was easy to get it back out, but it was totally demoralizing. And like we had to kind of restructure our minds because we, we, it was easy to almost get to the point where I was like, why are we doing this? This seems pointless. But we had to get up there, but there was this, like, we had to reset goals because what we were doing, we almost had to do it twice because there was someone that was working almost in, in exact opposition to the goal that we were trying to accomplish. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling. It's like that moment, I don't know if when you learned to drive, I did this, and I forgot to disengage the parking brake, and you're driving, but you're thinking like, man, I felt like this was going to be easier. Like, I feel like I should be going faster. I'm really working hard to make this happen, but, but we're not going anywhere. See, that, we can have very similar experiences in our faith where we feel like something is working in direct opposition to the goal that we're trying to accomplish. I don't know if you ever find yourself saying this about your faith journey with Jesus, but do you ever find yourself saying, like, I thought that this would be easier. Like, I thought that this would come easier. For example... Just a couple weeks ago, when we were looking in Ephesians chapter 4 together, we talked about the importance of, of putting on the new self, or the whole idea of what we called new self-living. We talked about how in Christ we have this, this new identity, and we're called to live according to, or really called to live out of this identity that he's given us in the new self. And I resonated with these verses. Like, it... it, it, it it felt like this is something I want to do more consistently. This is something that I want to be true in my own heart, my own life, my own faith. Matter of fact, if you remember, I suggested that we start every morning by looking ourselves in the mirror and saying, Look, I'm going to agree today with what God says about me. Remember that? Anybody do that? Me neither, really. Like I, I mean, not even just the idea of of remembering to start my day that way, that was hard enough. But, but really believing it, really like living out of that. I, I look at that and I get frustrated because I thought, what, this makes perfect sense to me. Why would I not do this? Why isn't this coming any easier to me? 
And, and, and I can look at a hundred examples throughout my faith journey, my walk with Jesus, and, and show you times when I said, okay, this makes perfect sense. This is, the, this is what I need to do. This is the direction. This is what I need to believe. And I'm committed to it. And yet it becomes increasingly, increasingly challenging. See, over the last nine weeks, we have been working our way through Paul's just, his absolutely incredible letter to the church in the city of Ephesus. And this morning, we are going to finish our series together. At Paul's last, last sort of thrust that he makes here with the church, these last words that he wants to write to them. And as he's doing so, he is going to help them understand the church there, the Ephesians, that they have someone who is working in opposition to their faith. That, that he's going to help them understand that they have um, an enemy. Let's take a look. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Before we get into the text, let's, let's pray together real quick. Father, as we look into your word this morning, Lord, show us more of you. Lord, open our hearts and minds to that which you would teach us and transform us by it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. This is Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look in verse 10. Through verse 20, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying in all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly, as I ought to speak. See, Paul here wants the church in Ephesus, he wants our church to understand that there is one who is opposed to that which God is doing. I want us to begin by looking this morning at our real battle. Our real battle. I had an opportunity to borrow a friend's car. This was years ago, but um, I was driving in his car, and I, I can't even remember why I needed it or what I was using it for, but as I looked down, I noticed on his dash, there was like a, a little piece of black tape. And I thought, what is that? And I sort of like peeled it back slightly to reveal the fact that his check engine light had come on. And his solution to dealing with the check engine light was to put this like piece of black tape over, over this warning that was going like, like problem fixed, right? Like I fixed the car, honey. Um, and I thought about that because I thought, what, how often do we do that in life where we look at the symptom? The problem wasn't the check engine light. The problem is there's, a, there's something going on in the engine that caused that to come on. But how often in our lives, even medically, do we do this where we can treat the symptoms, but we, we ignore or don't recognize what's causing it? See, because Paul now is concluding his letter to the church here. And there, there's really two sort of essential or fundamental realities that he wants to, to them to understand from the very outset. There is a battle, and the nature of this battle is spiritual. Let, let me ask you a question this morning. How aware are, are you in a day-in and day-out basis of the spiritual battle that is taking place around you and for you? Like, how cognizant of, of that are you? See, because if you are anything like me, I can live most of my life with, with little to no awareness or recognition that there is even a battle taking place, that this is, trans, this is going on all around me, transpiring all around me. 
As a matter of fact, if you're here this morning and you're new to the faith, or maybe you're still exploring what it, what it means to be a Christian, if this is right for you, you can hear all of this, and it almost sounds like science fiction, like we're, we're reading from a fantasy novel. You can think to yourself that isn't this just a way in an ancient culture to explain the unexplainable? Haven't, haven't we kind of got beyond all of this? And I understand that. On the flip side of this, I, I don't mean to suggest, and I think there's, there's danger here, that, that we see the devil behind everything in our lives, behind every stub toe, or when that guy like, gets the perfect parking spot right in front of us. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I think there is a danger in over-spiritualizing every aspect of our circumstances. But culturally, in general, we don't err that direction as much as we err in the direction of kind of almost, I would say for me, like spiritual ignorance regarding the reality of what is unfolding, of what Paul is laying out here, that we are in a spiritual battle. Additionally, then we have this tendency to treat the symptoms, but ignore the problem, the source, the, what's causing it. See, the nature of the battle for us that Paul's describing here is, isn't a political battle. This isn't a battle over economics. This isn't a nationalistic battle. It's not even an ideological battle. Although we can speak into those arenas, these are symptoms. They, they need to be addressed, but we have to understand that the battle is spiritual. This is where the fight is ultimately taking place. Look again at what Paul says in verse 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So Paul, Paul does not want the early church to be uninformed. He's saying, he's saying, if you have believed what God has done for you and what he said about you, so if, if you remember, if you've believed what we read and studied in chapters one through three, and if that has changed your life, chapter 4, if you're operating out of a new identity and, and living that out, it changes your behavior, and, and that changes your relationships, chapter 5 and first part of chapter 6, then you should expect what's coming here. You should expect to, to be engaged in, in a battle. He's like, this is a reality that you need to be prepared for. There are rulers and authorities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces that are acting in opposition to everything that God wants to work out in your life through, through Christ, what he's wanting to do in us and what he wants to accomplish through us. See, Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant here. And he certainly doesn't want us to live a life that is defeated. These are very real, very spiritual battles taking place, and we need to be prepared for it. So if we think back to a moment to how we started this morning, to those moments in life, specifically moments in our faith where, where we look and say, I thought this would be easier. Why isn't this coming more naturally to me? I'm, I, again, I don't want to be overdramatic here. There are times when that's my own laziness that's causing those things. But it is also important to recognize that there is a very real battle taking place, a real struggle that we're in the midst of. And this real battle that we're in the midst of also comes with a ruthless enemy, a ruthless enemy. I, uh, a couple years ago, I was picking up my, one of my daughters from the elementary school. And as we were driving out, she looked at a boy that was walking home on the side of the road and kind of groaned and said, Oh, he's my nemesis. I was like, really? Like, you have a nemesis. You're in third grade. Um, and, and I said, what, what makes him your nemesis? And she said, Dad, that boy is the opposite of me in every possible way. Um, which at the time, I was like, you know what? I'm, I hope that's the case for every boy, and we'll, we'll, let's go with this. Um, I actually had the opportunity uh, a couple years later to be a parent chaperone on a field trip down to the field museum with my daughter and I got set I sat in a seat with this same this nemesis boy uh, and I think she was right in every way I was, by the end of the trip he was my nemesis as well um, see this is what this is the picture that Paul's painting for us that there is a very real enemy who is opposed in every way 
to what God wants to accomplish in our life. Look again back in verses 10 and 11. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Stand against the schemes of the devil. Now Paul is identifying for us who is behind this struggle. And again, I acknowledge, like in our our modern kind of scientific culture, it, it can almost feel silly to read this. It can almost feel like that Dana Carvey church lady skit from SNL years and years and years ago, where it's like this caricature of a fanatical, old-fashioned religious stereotype, if you remember it. Which is interesting, by the way, because I've had the opportunity as a youth pastor to travel to a variety of different cultures. And that is somewhat unique to us. That's probably not true. I think it's also the case in Europe and some other places, but you can travel across Latin America and other places, and there is not this, um, there is almost more the assumption or the awareness is evident of spiritual warfare and the reality of an enemy, that they see it and understand it and they know who's orchestrating it. See, I I don't want to overstate this, but I think it's important for us to understand a couple things here. First, we have to understand the purpose of our enemy. His purpose. If you look in 1 Peter um, chapter 5, this is at the very end of this book, but Peter highlights this. This is verses 8 and 9. He says, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. See, Peter is, is, is very clear. He's seeing the devil's objective. His purpose is to devour. He is hell-bent on destroying God's purposes and on God's people. And his attack is relentless. He, he is, is committed to his destruction. I've actually seen different celebrities or different people make comments about the idea of Satan and saying things like, I think that he would be a fun guy to hang out with or I'd, I'd like to party with him. Which I get the facetiousness of that. I understand that they're, they're not necessarily talking literal. But, but it underscores how naive we can be at times about, about his reality and about his purpose. To separate us from, from what God is doing in our lives. From the truth that he's placed in our lives. He can't separate us from his love. That has already been secured. But he will do everything in his power to cause us to doubt that, to make us ineffective in in who we are and the role that God has called us to believe, that what he's provided to us. His nature is to be destructive, and his primary weapon then that he uses to accomplish that is his lies. His lies. Jesus describes the devil or Satan this way. He says in John chapter 8, the second half of verse 44, he says, He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of, it, the char- out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Take for a moment just, just what we have been taught in, in Paul's letter to us to the Ephesians. Listen to some of the things that Paul has said are true about us. This is from from chapter 1, verse 5, at the very outset. He says, you, church, you were predestined for adoption. But Satan would have us believe or call us illegitimate children. In verse 13, he says, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, but, but Satan would have us believe or he would cause us to doubt our inheritance. In chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, you've been saved by grace. It's not of works. But Satan's going to tell you that you have to earn it. Later in chapter 2, he says we've been given access by the Holy Spirit, but Satan would have us believe we've been shut out. In chapter 4, verse 3, he says we as a body, we can be unified by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, but Satan's going to tell you you can't work with that person, or you're just too different, or you're never going to get along. Later in chapter 4, he says put on the new self. But Satan keeps causing us, just telling us to revert back, to live out of an old identity, to continue to fall into the ways of the old self. 
And does any of this sound familiar to you? Because it does to me. This is why Paul says in in chapter 4, verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, that we have to continue to let the truth of, of Jesus permeate our minds because we have an enemy who is telling us exactly the opposite. See, the point is that that our enemy, the devil, is absolutely opposed to everything that God wants to do for us and in us and in his church. His purposes are to destroy, and he will use every lie at his disposal in order to accomplish it. But there is such good news in this passage. This is what I'm calling our ready defense. Our ready defense Look at the three imperatives that at the outset of these verses here. In verse 10, it says, Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. How do we do that? Beginning of verse 11, we put on the whole armor of God. And in the second half of that verse, why? So that we can stand against the devil. See, now Paul is going to help us understand what this looks like. And how do we become, as Christians, battle-ready? I don't know if you've ever experienced something in your life where you've been totally ill-equipped, but it's not a good feeling. You become really vulnerable. Years ago when I was a youth pastor, I, I led this, um, this charity fundraising event, and it was, it was a, a bike ride. Um, and it was probably, I don't know, maybe 25 miles or something like that. But, but the issue was I, was, I didn't really, I didn't own a bike, so I wasn't out riding a bike. I didn't prepare in any way possible. And I went and borrowed like my brother-in-law's like $60 bike from Target and, and all these sorts of things. And it turns out that you, the right equipment matters in these sorts of things. Matter of fact, like this whole troop, students, everybody is like well down the path. And eventually I just start to drag behind. I didn't even have a helmet. And they were like every, right? They had to go find a helmet for me to put on. And I couldn't keep up with anybody. Um, partly because I was out of shape and partly because I didn't have the right equipment. And so one of these like professional guys ended up trading bikes with me halfway through the ride. It was like training for him, like see if I can make it on this, this bike and, and this sort of thing. And like, you know that feeling, like I don't have, I'm ill prepared for what's in front of me. And, and it creates an issue for us. We become extremely vulnerable in our confidence because dwindles tremendously. Look at what Paul tells us here. He tells us how to be prepared. This is verse 13. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which, it, which you can use, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. See, that Paul's now helping us understand how we can stand. This primary imperative, we're called to stand in God's strength. We're called to put on his armor in the midst of this battle waging around us. Yes, there is a very real battle. Yes, we have a ruthless enemy, but God has equipped us to stand up in the midst of the attack. And Paul here is drawing on two descriptions or two sort of illustrations. The first and and most obvious is that of a Roman soldier. Again, he's writing this from, from prison in Rome. This is a sight that he saw every day was these Roman soldiers and their equipment. So he's using this as an illustration. But secondly, and I think most importantly, Paul is alluding to Old Testament descriptions of the Messiah, where he's given this sort of warrior language. He specifically draws on some of Isaiah's descriptions. In fact, this is from Isaiah 59, 17. This is describing the Messiah, Jesus. He says, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and and a helmet of salvation on his head. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 gives further sort of clues into this. Isaiah chapter 42, Paul is is rooting this equipping for battle and what he is describing for us here in the person and the work of the Messiah. He's saying that, that it's grounded in the victory that he has already won. So Paul is instructing us, and hear me on this, Paul is instructing us to wear, to clothe ourselves with his accomplished 
victory, to put that on. And notice that Paul's description here of this armor begins and ends with truth. It's sandwiched with truth. In verse 14, he tells us, put on the belt of truth. At the end, in verse 17, he said, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is reminder that this is ultimately a battle for truth, that truth serves as our primary defense. It's It's the tool by which we advance the gospel is his truth. Paul wants us to to put on the truth of Christ every day. And so he adds this description to this. He talks about the breastplate of righteousness. He says, Jesus imputed righteousness onto us. So again, thinking about the attacks that come when, when Satan accuses us, when, when he wants to say that we could never be what God has said about us, he could never be called sons and daughters, our answer, our response to that is Jesus' perfect life applied to us. Like he, he can't touch us. He says, put on the peace, the gospel of peace shoes, which on a, a total side note, this is actually one of the, the innovations of the Roman Empire. That, that changed their military structure and their power, how they, they altered their shoes and put little nails through them. They basically created cleats that gave them the, the readiness in order to attack. It gave them a firm footing. And he's saying this is the gospel in our lives. It, it, it makes us alert. It makes us ready to advance. The shield of faith, verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which it, which with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. Again, this is not a reference to our own power to believe. This is not about believing harder. This is a dependence on or reliance on the faithfulness of God, on his ability to save. So what protects us from from the flaming darts of the evil one? It's our faith in him. It's our, our relationship to him. The helmet of salvation and this sort of says it all. What, what do we have to claim? I've been saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. He's saying, wear it. This is how we stand. This is how we fight back against the tax of, of the evil one. We put on Christ and what he accomplished on our behalf. Real quickly, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I just want you to hear this. This is verses 3 through 5. Again, Paul is is developing a very similar thought here. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And how do we do all of this? And this is really key in this. This this is our secret weapon. Look again at what Paul says our secret weapon is at the end of this. This is 18 and through 20. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. See, Paul begins and he concludes this letter with prayer. How do we, how do we put on the armor of God? How do we prepare ourselves for the battle that is inevitable? Paul's saying you do it with prayer. We stay alert and we pray. This this is how we activate our spiritual armor. Otherwise, we go out and we make ourselves entirely vulnerable. We go out and and we go out as ones who are ill-equipped and unprepared. And that's when we tend to believe the lies that Satan would, would seek to speak into us, that he brings against us. Um, when I was a kid, I... And I'll, I'll wrap up with this, but I, uh, I told you a couple weeks ago, like the outfit I wore to my first day of middle school, I think, which was like suspenders and short. It was, it was a rough start to middle school. 
And it didn't get better from there. Like, uh, um, I, you know, I was skinny little punk, and I, I got picked on and all these sorts of things. And I remember riding the bus home um, one day, and, and these two older boys on the bus just decided to give me a hard time. Um, and just kind of were relentless the whole time, just, just going after me, whatever, making fun of me, and, and just kind of um, basically like bullying, you know. And, and I get off the bus, my parents were actually out of town. My, the bus, I, where I grew up in this small rural town, our, our middle school was way out in the middle of the country for some odd reason. So it was like a 20 minute bus ride. And it, it dropped us back off at the high school and I went, my grandma was picking me up after school and my brother was already in the car, the high school had already been dismissed. And I just get in the car, I just start to break down, like crying, you know, it's just been a bad day kind of thing. Um, and she asked obviously what happened, what, what's going on? And I explained to her what had happened on the bus, and I just gotten like tired of it. I had had enough of it, or whatever. And and it just so happens that at that moment, walking down the street were these two boys, um, who were walking down the opposite side of the street. And I said, "There, there they go, Grandma." <laughs> and I'm, this is not an exaggeration. My grandma does like my grandma was probably 80 pounds, like at her heaviest. Um, but you did not mess with Georgia Fraley or her people, you know. She does like a Rockford file style like U-turn where like the tires are screeching and smoke is coming out the back of the car um, in her like 1986 Nissan Maxima and spins that car around and just starts going down the road. Like I'm like, don't, don't run them down, Grandma. Like, <laughs> and she pulls up next to these boys and she looks at my older brother who was not like me. He was a big dude, always could take care of himself kind of thing. And she said, you go talk to those boys. And, uh, and I don't know what my older brother said, but I just looked out the window and he had both of these kids lifted off the ground by their shirts um, in the air. Um, my brother had a strict policy that he could beat the tar out of me anytime he wanted, but no one else was allowed to. <laughs> and he sits there and he said, look, like, this is my kid brother. And if I ever hear of you touching or messing with him again, then you're going to have to deal with me. And he put the boys down and, and they went on their way. And I'll tell you, I never had a problem on the bus from that day forward. Not one time. Matter of fact, the next day on the bus, some of those kids were like, hey, uh, like, I like your suspenders, you know? Like, <laughs> and because they knew I had a defender. You see, they knew that there was somebody behind me who was bigger than me, who could fight my fights for me, that they were going to have to answer to. And this is exactly what Paul is describing for us. He is saying, put on Jesus. You have a defender. Your victory has been won. With prayer every day, start your lives by putting on his righteousness, his salvation, the truth of his gospel, because he's done it for you. And that enemy, when he comes and when he tries to lie to you, you can look him in the eye and say, you can't touch me. I have Jesus. I have Jesus. This is our prayer for us as the church, that we, like Paul, would put on Christ, that we would wear his victory, that we would be bold in preaching the gospel, not only when our circumstances are, are going well and things are happening according to plan, but in every stage, every aspect of life, because our salvation has been secured, because our victory has been won. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you and your spirit have equipped us for the battle that is taking place. So God, I pray that we as your church would not be ignorant. We would not live as those who are one aware that we would equip ourselves by the power of prayer, that we would wear each and every day what you say about us, what you accomplish through Christ, and then our enemy would be defeated. We look forward to that day when that is final and complete. But in now, enable us to fight the good fight. And it's in your name we pray.